How I actually got interested in ophthalmology, Dave, was through one of these mission trips. I was abroad teaching English, but there was a medical team that had come and one of the things that they did was cataract surgery. And the first time I saw that surgery being done on a patient who walked in, hunched over, crippled, it was like it was a whole new person. So that was actually what got me interested in ophthalmology and why I uh, devoted my life to taking care of eye patients. We were told when we're younger, everyone needs health care. So as long as you follow the this path, you're going to have a very steady, secure path. But as I got into practice, I realized medicine is not as steady as it is. So I got a sense that I was actually not in as much control as I thought. And that's when I started looking at how can I gain back a little bit more control? You were saying the now versus 20 years from now, I get the cash flow now. I could do what I want with it. I can't do that with the stock market. Just commit to something. Even if you have to course correct later, get educated, commit yourself to something and just go after it. Good day, everyone. This is Dr. David Phelps of the Freedom Founders Mastermind Community and the Dentist Freedom Blueprint Podcast. Today, I have a non-dentist, but I'm thrilled to have uh, Dr. Nancy Huynh with us uh, today, and I'll give you a little bit more about her in a moment. But uh, Nancy, so good to have you with us. So great to be here, Dave. Thanks for having me. Like so many people, I have the blessing to have the opportunity to meet and converse with. Uh, and Nancy comes to me through, uh, through through other people that we both know. You know, mutual mutual contacts uh, and you know, engaged people that we have uh, in this case, the universe of real estate, uh, not medicine or dentistry, which is which is okay. It's kind of our, our side or I would say our alter ego, right? Nancy, it's kind of what, uh, what's That's become. Right. And we'll talk about that a little bit today, but let me get a little bit of background on Nancy. Uh, Nancy's a physician, she's an eye surgeon. Uh, she's an entrepreneur and an impact real estate investor. As an ophthalmologist, she's made a real difference in thousands of lives by solving people's most pressing eye problems and performing sight-saving eye surgeries. She helps people to see better so they can regain their identity, dignity, and vision for the future. Nancy started investing in real estate to create passive income, hoping to regain control over time and stop trading time for money. She currently owns and operates a real estate investment portfolio in the Atlanta area. She founded Clear Vision Investing to not only grow her own portfolio, but also to help others realize the power of real estate. She's passionate about helping others, especially women physicians, gain financial literacy and achieve financial security through real estate investing. She believes that financially intelligent physicians can change medicine and the world for the better. We're going to talk about that today because I'm a big believer in, in that aspect. As an impact investor, Nancy believes that real estate investing can deliver attractive financial returns while also making a positive social impact. Part of the profits from her company are donated to giving the gift of sight to someone in need and to cure preventable blindness globally. Nancy is a graduate of Yale University and Harvard Medical School. She currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia with her husband and two young daughters. Nancy, I, I told you when we first had a chance to, to connect and meet and talk a little bit, was one of the, besides you being in the healthcare world, uh, besides you being um, a mother, a physician, uh, but also an ophthalmologist. And I, I told you briefly that my, my father was an ophthalmologist. He's, he's since left us, but uh, he also uh, loved his profession. He loved doing what he, what he did to serve people and help them with sight. He made a number of trips to China um, after he retired from his practice. This is when he was still in his 60s. A number of trips to China uh, to do a cataract surgery, mm -hmm. um, to, to, you know, do them on one eye, one eye, but to give one eye, one good eye. And he loved those trips. And I still have his journals, Nancy, from those trips where he, he wrote, you know, where he was and, and just, ah, you know, it's that, that impact you're talking about. And I think the, the hard thing for a lot of us is that we're, we're, we're driven to, to be good technical providers in what we do. That's where our training came from. And yes, it takes a lot of work, a lot of time, dedication. Um, schedules are harried today. And we're trying to balance uh, our practices with our families. Uh, and then we're trying to figure out also the financial model. Oh my gosh, there's so much to balance. <laughs> Yet the bottom line is we want to do good for the world. And so putting all this together is something I think it's a puzzle we've been trying to solve. And I, I love the fact that you're on the same path. Yeah, it's so interesting you mentioned that, you know, how I actually got interested in ophthalmology, Dave, was um, through one of these mission trips. I was abroad um, teaching English, but there was a medical team that had come, and one of the things that they did was cataract surgery. And the first time I saw that surgery being done on a patient who walked in, hunched over, crippled, had to hold someone, had walked wow. miles and miles to come and get it and took off that patch. It was like the world opened up and they suddenly stood up 
straighter. They, um, you know, opened their eyes and it was like, it was a whole new person. And it, it almost reminded me of like a wilted flower. And then they mm. saw the sun and just wilted upward. So that was actually what got me interested in ophthalmology and why I, uh, you know, have devoted my life to, um, to taking care of eye patients. Yeah, well, that's, that's certainly a, a real reason why to get involved in uh, when, when you have that, those experiences uh, inbred in you from an early age, and you get to actually witness uh, the change in someone's life that in this case, um, eyesight means uh, is tremendous. So, so Nancy, tell us when you came to the point of, of thinking, I'm working hard, you know, as, as medical professionals, you make a good income, mm -hmm. but you, you, at some point where you realize that just trading time for dollars and putting money in a 401k, which is what kind of everybody does because that's the default mode. That when did you decide that that really wasn't maybe a plan that was going to get you to where you wanted to go? Yeah, like a lot of health professionals, we spend years and years in training and kind of think we were told when we're younger, everyone needs health care. So as long as you follow this path, you're going to have a very steady, secure path. But as we all know, we also have an unusual path in that we spend most of our 20s in school in debt um, with a negative net worth, um, hundreds and thousand dollars in debt. And we start off even, um, you know, poorer than a homeless person, I like to say. So you think that once you arrive at that attending level, you know, you do all this training, you're trying to reach to the top and you get to that attending level, it's going to be all set. You have a six figure income and it's going to be very steady. But as I got into practice, I realized medicine is not as steady as it is. Yes, people need healthcare, but you're still dictated. It's not no longer a patient doctor relationship. Healthcare, as we notice, yes, it's a patient and doctor and a 17 other people is insurance companies, it's administrators, everyone wants their hands in it, it's the government. And I realized that I was just one email away from telling me my paycheck was gonna be cut or one phone call away saying, you know, your cataract surgery, the reimbursements are coming down. So I got a sense that I was actually not in as much control as I thought. And that's when I started looking at how can I gain back a little bit more control? I still love what I do, but I'm not in control of how I could practice medicine and what the financial income will come in. And it's got to start learning and seeing how I can make passive income. And I, as you said, I was very passive, just dump my money in 401ks, IRAs and mutual funds and let it sit. And I said, I really have to take a more active approach. And that's how I discovered real estate. So putting your money, dumping it, as you said, into IRAs and 401ks, which is what, again, what we're taught to do. Did you just see that as being an arena that just you were just kind of a hope and a prayer. You, you know, everybody does it, says you're going to be okay. But were you actually looking at it from the standpoint of a financial model that just wasn't showing you what you, what you thought you needed? Or was it just the fact that you can't access any of that capital until you're 59 and a half? It's, I call it putting it into, into the retirement plan lockbox. I mean, it's just, it's locked up. So, so you, you, you can't even get to it unless you want to pay the penalty and the tax to, to get it out. And so that didn't make sense to me. What, what did you see in that that, was, that made you think twice about staying on that particular path? It's all of the above that you mentioned, Dave. It was the fact that I felt like I was just dumping it in and taking a gamble because I, truth, truthfully, I didn't understand much of it. I just saw red arrows, you know, green arrows. One day is red and one day is green. And okay, it went up a little. And then the next month I check and it's down, you know, 20% um, or whatnot. And I was just sick of riding the Wall Street roller coaster and having no control. And then the second point that you mentioned, Dave, is also very true. It's just like, I didn't want that money locked up and having them dictate what I can or cannot do. For instance, when my two children were born, I opened up a 529 plan for them. Well, I can't really use it for much else. What if they decide they don't want to go to school? That money is very limited in what it could do. The same thing with these retirement accounts. I have to wait until I'm in my 60s to pull it out. Well, what if I want to retire earlier or, or live my life a different way? I can't use that money. And it's exactly like you said, it was like a lockbox. And I did not want that. I didn't want someone dictating how I was going to spend my money or when I could take it out. Now, I can't tell you how many times I have the privilege of working with other doctors, physicians, dentists, and, mm -hmm. and they've been very disciplined, very disciplined in putting money into those 401k mm -hmm. and retirement plans, you know, built up a sizable amount. And yet they're in their, I have some that are in their um, 40s, late 40s, early 50s, and they've got a lot there. And, and, and if only they didn't have it tied up you know, they could turn that into that passive cash flow today, uh, use it, get the same tax benefits that we get through real estate and actually free up their time, maybe not completely exit practice, but but it, having the options open, it's like, 
I can't do anything until I'm 59 and a half. You know, we can do, we can work with that money, but you can't touch it till then. And it's like, no. and they, they, and the regrets start to show up. But again, it's the problem is we just don't know what we don't know unless we're curious as I've been, as you have been and others uh, to seek a different path. So what, what turns you on to real estate? What, what, you know, you, you didn't like what you had, uh, didn't look like it was a path that was going to take you where you want to go in the time you wanted to get there, but who to, turns you into real estate? Um, some experience, somebody you knew, what was it? No, it was basically through my research, Dave. I, I, as I said, I went on this quest to say, there has to be a better way than what I'm doing. I know this is what everyone has told me to do. And I was like the little chimper, um, just like I did with our medical career, which is a straight path that we follow, right? A very linear path. I was like, I'm going to do what everyone else is doing. I'm going to follow in their footsteps. I'm going to stock money away. But I said, this is not working. And if it's not working, you either, you know, slump down and cry yourself to sleep or you find a better way. And for me, I was like, I'm going to empower myself. I'm going to know what I'm investing in. So just started reading books, um, listening to podcasts, watching webinars. And then I felt confident enough to say, this is easy, this is simple math. You know, we've been through medical school, dental school, professional school that this is nothing. Um, so I bought that first property and I saw the benefits immediately that first year, you know, um, benefits of real estate, the cash flow that came in, I didn't have to go to work and put on those scrubs and do those extra surgeries, you know, to get that cash flow. Um, and then at the end of the year, I saw the tax benefits and the power of that depreciation that everyone talks about. I was like, I see what they mean right now. I see what they mean that even though I'm collecting money, I'm to the government and on paper, they think I'm losing money. And I said, this works, this works. And it was a proof of concept that I just went down the snowball and um, I was sold from there on. And so I've pretty much uh, other than maxing out my, you know, 401ks and IRAs, um, I've dumped every single penny into real estate because I truly believe in it. And, and the it. other thing, you know, to mention is you were saying the now versus 20 years from now, I get the cash flow now. I could do what I want with it. If I want to pay my bills with it, great. If I want to go buy myself a purse, I could do that with that cash flow. I can't do that with the stock market. Exactly. I know people will be curious to know what was your first property that you that you acquired. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, it was. So after I started this journey, I two months later, I was like, I feel confidence. So I put together a team of a realtor, a lender, um, property manager. And my first property was a duplex in the Atlanta area, right in my backyard, about 30 minutes away from where I live. Um, so it was a pretty turnkey, just a couple of things. So I just had the contractor finish up a couple of things and rented it out. And um, I, I like that it was a duplex because even if one side was vacant, I still got money on the other side to cover the mortgage. Um, so that was my first property was basically a duplex in my backyard. And in terms of context of time, about what year was this? This was 2020, right in the middle of COVID. Right in the middle of COVID. And yeah. Yes. And that, it really accelerated my path because COVID within the matter of 24 hours, they told me, shut down your clinic, shut down your OR. And I was like, this further proves my point. So I got to do something. So I was like, you know, I'm going to buy this property and I'm going to either, either it's going to work or it's not, but at least I tried. I'm not going to just sit here. So it was right in the middle of COVID. And so, so 2020, so we're basically two years mm -hmm. down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, give us, give us kind of a, a, a pulse. I, I, I know that you are, I'd call you a, a relatively active investor today, and we can you know, break down. There's you know people that want to be completely passive, and they want to find people to invest through, and that's certainly a good way to do it. You can invest yeah. in syndications, which is a lot of what you're you're doing, yeah, doing. Or, mm -hmm. or some have funds that are based on real estate. Um, you can be semi-active and 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 participate um, in in some of those, and maybe be a little more active. And and then some people just want to be active, like well, kind of like you were on your first property, and maybe still are to some extent, uh, act, actually out procuring, identifying opportunities and being a part of the, the capital raise and maybe some part mm -hmm. of that. So, so, so you moved pretty quickly. I'm people will be curious, you know, how, again, how did you do all this? Um, you're, you're a wife, you're a mother, you're a physician <laughs> with a practice, uh, and you're also building up a real estate team uh, to go out and do what you want to do. So give us some context. Was it, was it hard at first? Did you have to sacrifice a little bit, but to know that there was a, an end goal that wasn't going to be like way down the road? How did you, you and your husband kind of deal with, with, with optimizing your, your time element? 
yeah, as you said, I, I wear many different roles among them, you know, being uh, a physician, a surgeon, a wife, a mom to two young girls. They're, they're five and two. Um, so they're, they're relatively young and also doing this real estate. I was very committed to the real estate. Once I got that proof of concept, I said, this is what I want to do. So I think the first step, you know, to your audience is just commit just commit to something. Even if you have to course correct later, if you commit to something, you'll see if this is what is for you. If it's not, you pivot. And so that's what I did. I, I just made a commitment to myself. This is the path I want to go. And as you said, I've sort of taken different turns with wind real estate as I got further into it. Um, but, you know, the first step I would say, get educated, commit yourself to something and just go after it. If you enjoyed watching or learning from this video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more content. If you have a question about any of my content or this specific video, just please leave a comment down below. And as always, stay focused on your freedom. I'll see you next time.